Welcome. My name is Kevin, and this is the Bible Artist Podcast. I believe the arts can give us fresh eyes to see the significance of the Bible and the beauty of the gospel. I also believe the Bible can provide the arts with complex characters and stories with profound insight into the human condition. I've been a fan of Bible art for most of my life, and so over the past few years, I've been exploring popular Bible adaptations, and I've been encouraging Christian communities to discuss and engage with the arts. Today, my guest is Elijah Alexander, but I want to warn you before the conversation, there were some connection issues, so it may get choppy at certain points. I'm doing my best to clean it up in editing. I just wanted to give you that advance notice. Elijah Alexander is my guest today. Uh, You probably know him best from The Chosen, in which he plays Atticus Emilius, a Roman investigator who becomes interested in the ministry of Jesus and his disciples. But Elijah has been in a variety of other things, uh, stage productions, TV shows, video games, Hollywood blockbusters like Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Um, So Elijah, before we get into The Chosen, I'm just interested how you got uh, into acting and uh, what kind of draws you to acting. Thank you, Kevin. It's great to be here. Great to be a part of your um, vision. I, 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 like you, truly believe that art reflects the best of uh, the source material. And it is, is the reason I became, you know, my fascination with art and actually my fascination with the Bible to begin with, in Hebrew school growing up, um, really, and and the Greeks, and my uh, introduction to Shakespeare. So it was through through a combination of the source material of the Bible, the Old Testament, and the arts that Mm. created a a strong desire in me to be an art, become an artist. Um, So... That seed was planted at a very, very early age for me, um, huh. not because of my exposure to theater, but as I said, because of my uh, my exposure to poetry at an early mm. age through school and in, in Hebrew school, my exposure to the Bible and mm. uh, and storytelling, and so and so it became. Um, um, the strongest desire in me to be, to to mm. become a storyteller because I was so moved and literally transformed um, through the stories that I was told mm. in 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 school, and mm. so I uh, at a very very early age was drawn to through humanities and through creative writing and through poetry mm-hmm. i was introduced to the greats you know to the the great greek stoics um oh. i mean we're talking you know in my teens you know in high school mm. um but that's that's where it all began for me and and mm. so it's been a, a lifelong career-long journey for me um, to to develop my artistic spirit mm. So you're very like kind of familiar with a lot of kind of the the source material and like a lot of not just the biblical source material but kind of the larger cultural matrix of kind of the ancient world. Yes, 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 yes. I I mean, look, they say that um all paths art alone endures, right? So so mm. this is this is one of the the mantras I use um and I was touched at a very early age to become compelled to become an artist. But it was, again, uh, hmm. forgive me for repeating myself, but it was because of my introduction to the humanities, to, to art, to art history, to hmm. visual art, to performing hmm. art, and to, the, and to the source material. So I, I was a, um, I studied, they, they say that all stories, all contemporary stories come from one of three sources, right? You have the Bible, hmm. you have the Greeks, and you have Shakespeare. Shakespeare mm. took all of his, you know, used as his source material, um, Ovid's, uh, uh, not Ovid, but um, P- uh, Petrarch's, mm. uh, Petrarch's lives, right? So he took a lot mm. of his uh, ideas from history, right? Mm. And he also drew from the Bible. And mm. he also drew from the Greeks. So, because they obviously, both of those, both of those, um, uh, bodies of work preceded him, preceded his. Mm. 
So they say that all stories emanate or, or the genesis of all contemporary stories, you know, from TV shows to soap operas to film mm. to plays have their beginnings in one of mm. those three from one of those three sources. And so mm. I, I've studied in depth. Um, you know, I've spent 28 years doing Shakespeare's, mm. you know, works. I was classically trained, uh, got a, a master's of fine arts and acting from the Yale School of Drama. And I, I've spent the last almost 30 years working in theater, TV, film, mostly theater, um, mm. all over this country, in the regions, on Broadway, uh, also overseas in London. Mm. So I have a, <laughs> I have a great deal of experience with mm. um, Shakespeare in particular, mm. um, and and his classic classical contemporaries, mm. uh, and all, and in the last few years I've been um, given a great honor and privilege to be a part of the Chosen family, and that's mm. just taken my work in a whole new trajectory. But I moved uh, I moved to Hollywood in 2004. With this seems like a lifetime ago. It really is a lifetime ago. Uh, from New York, and did my first major motion picture. I did Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and then mm. I I was based in L.A. and it all it all sort of my my film and TV work sort of took off from there. Oh, oh that's really cool. The Chosen isn't like your first uh, film that's based on uh, a biblical story. I saw it. In your filmography, uh, "Amazing Love," which looks like it's it's based on the story of Hosea. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Kevin. So, yeah, so so when I was in Hebrew school, that really is the where the seed was planted. I I, I in learning about Moses, I wanted to be Moses. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. to be play these um, prophets um, and and you know inhabit their spirit and tell their stories i mean it was that was my introduction to drama you know was through mm -hmm. as i said through the bible and so it was a it was such a full circle sort of fulfillment when i got to play in 2011 i got to play hosea in um in a in a movie called amazing love and i got to go back to my father's homeland, Israel, to shoot the mm. film. So it was a big deal. I have, you know, uh, I have a, a great deal of family in Israel. And so, mm. so we were, um, it was j just such an amazing, monu important um, event for me to go mm. back to my father's homeland with a creative project, be able mm. to work there. We, we shot the whole thing in Nazareth. Um, and so I got to, and I'm, you know, walking in the sandals of, uh, a minor prophet from the mm. old Testament, Hosea. Um, and it's a beautiful story, an amazing message. And, mm. um, yeah, that actually, that started my, um, that was, that was sort of my entrance into the, the biblical, uh, dramatic world, um, mm. that was, Produced by Trinity Broadcasting, um, and and a lot of the, actually the director on that film recommended me to Dallas for the Chosen. So I mean it was a, it was uh -huh. a, the way that all aligned was kind of was kind of miraculous. But it had been huh. sort of in the works for for mm. more than a decade. Oh yeah, no that that does sound like an amazing experience. Um, yeah, just getting to kind of spend that time really kind of fulfilling that childhood dream of, of stepping into the shoes of, of one of the prophets. As far as The Chosen goes, um, so another kind of uh, Bible-based uh, story, you know, New Testament this time, um, where, you know, it's mostly focused on, you know, stories about Jesus and the disciples, um, but it also introduces fictional storylines and characters. Uh, but even though Atticus is made up, uh, his position, the cohortes urbani, that was a real thing. Uh, what's your kind of understanding of, of what that position was all about? So, yeah. So, um, the cohortus urbani were, uh, part of an elite sort of task force, um, uh, who answered directly to the emperor. 
So um, they had usually had military backgrounds and were well-versed and, and well-educated. Um, but basically they're, they're a, you know, they're an, an ancient, um, the, the ancient CIA, you know, would be the, mm. the sort of the direct line in terms of contemporary. They were part of a, they were detectives. They were mm. part of an elite detective task force. And um, they did the emperor's work. Mm. And so, um, yes, the, the title wa it is historically accurate, but the character is not. So the character is probably based on, um, I mean, it's obviously a fictional character, but based on characters who actually could have yeah. and did walk the earth and, and, um, mm. and, and fulfill these roles. So, and as an actor, it's a, it's a, a dream because hmm. I'm not beholden to, to, um, literal translation. Right. So hmm. I'm not, you know, taken from scripture. Atticus is, is, uh, born of the imagination of the writers. And then, hmm. um, in my hands, you know, I get to use my imagine, imagination too, and to create, hmm. uh, a fully fleshed, uh, complicated character, so it's mm. it's an it really is an actor's dream, and mm. you know Atticus is be, because of his role he's a naturally he has to be a naturally curious um, observer, uh, mm. and he's got a so he's you know very, very sensually aware mm. um, he's a uh, 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 his job is is mainly relation relational or re, you know based mm. on re, developing relationships to get mm. information so he's got his fingers on the pulse of what's happening he's out there in the field he's a field specialist right so he's talking mm. to people gathering information gathering intel and using his influence uh to sway opinion to mm. um to further the agenda of the empire mm. yeah so uh, it's been a it's been a, an absolute dream it's a it's a mm. i've always been fascinated yeah i mean i've always been fascinated with um that world mm. and so it's also a kind of a dream to play a detective mm. to play uh mm. Um, because I've always been drawn to the, to those stories as well in, mm. in film in particular, and the world of undercover, um, uh, spies and the intrigue and the mystery involved and the, the danger, it's mm. always been very, uh, exciting to me. So to be mm. able to play the ancient, you know, 40 AD version of mm. a spy or a detective is is actually really really thrilling for me, and uh, uh, really exciting, and the, and mm. the fact that I'm a part of this monumental pro project that is changing so many lives and influencing so mm. many lives um, is is just my deepest and greatest honor. Mm. Yeah. So you were talking earlier about kind of the, the complexities of uh, your character. And uh, one of the things that I liked about season three is we kind of started to see a little bit more of, of those uh, things coming to the surface. So, you know, we see um, he doesn't uh, rat out Simon Z uh, or like kind of continue to try to get him. Uh, he actually warns him about uh, the zealots that are after him. Uh, he, he keeps Quintus from wiping out the tent city. Yep. He kind of, uses some of his uh, relational wisdom uh, with that. Uh, he kind of minimizes the, the danger of uh, Jesus when he's reporting to Pilate. Uh, so as the show continues, are we going to get to see a little bit more of kind of what's motivating your character and maybe either backstory or just um, kind of what he's, he's after, I guess. Uh, great question and great insight. And yeah, that's one of the, the most exciting uh, pieces of this 
char of the character development for me is that there, he's not a straightforward guy. I mean, Atticus is an instrument of the empire, right? But he, at, at his baseline, um, his MO is creating the conditions for peace. He's mm. a peacemaker, right? He's not, mm. a, um, in, this isn't, and this isn't in the, in the, um, in the, uh, the episodes, it's in the, in the storytelling as we're doing it, but it's part of my backstory. You know, I, I feel like Atticus has a military background. He's seen, been in, you know, he's fought in battles, in wars. He's seen bloodshed. He's seen violence. He's dealt with it. And he, he now he's more of a diplomat. So he's really uh, out there to create, like I said, to create the conditions for peace. He wants to avoid huh. civil unrest, civil war. He wants to, to appease all the factions, the religious, hmm. the Sanhedrin, the religious, the Jewish religious f faction. He wants to, to um, contain what, what he sees as uh, a potentially threatening uh, um, organization, right? These, hmm. these, these followers of hmm. this peaceful prophet have hmm. am amassed in number, right? They're, they're, hmm. they're growing in number. And so, he he's just concerned. Atticus is concerned about uh, the potential for that, for an uprising, for mm. civil war. But ultimately, mm. he's he's not looking to. I mean, the zealots, the zealot faction, are a violent faction. So mm -hmm. we see in in season two his mm -hmm. response to that. You know, he's trying yep. to avoid an assassination of one of of one of his senators, of one of his um, of one of the Roman magistrates, right? Mm. So, but in doing so, he has created a sort of a reluctant alliance with Simon mm -hmm. Z, uh, mm -hmm. because they he Atticus realizes they have a common goal, right? Mm -hmm. They have a common enemy in the zealotry. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, ultimately, ultimately Atticus wants to further the glory of the realm of the Empire mm -hmm. of Rome. Yes, but he wants to create. Uh, the conditions for peace and harmony in the streets. Otherwise, you know, the, the alternative is, is just um, unappealing to everybody, mm. you know, fr from the top down. Mm. So he uses his, his wisdom and his experience mm. to, and through his, you know, relationships, building relationships, mm. um, to he just definitely has an agenda but it's more of a diplomatic peaceful one mm -hmm. so yeah no that is that is really like a a fun uh role i'm sure as an actor to be kind of doing kind of some of that subtle work um in building relationships and trying to kind of juggle different alliances and things like that uh, one of the places that i i saw that um really show up it was in season three where we get to see uh, Atticus's relationship with Pilate. So I, I'm curious kind of how you would describe uh, that relationship mm -hmm. and some of the dynamics uh, there. It's interesting. I'm, I'm learning a lot about, um, you know, when you're working on certain personal development and uh, looking to master uh, a particular skill or a particular uh, uh, trade or, you know, they, all, the, all the greats say, study, find a teacher, then find a, a partner, someone who you can practice with. Find a teacher mm. that you can study under, apprentice mm. with, who knows more than you do and ha who has mm. mastered something you want to master. Then mm. find a sparring partner, right? Mm. Someone who you can practice with. And then find someone to teach. Find a student. And so I approach, I, I bring that up because that's a part of how I approach my life and my the the craft and the skill of acting that's how i've always approached it and when i want to learn something new when i want to master something um and that's an ongoing process of course but i also apply that to the roles i take on and so atticus is prime example i mean he's hmm. he's you know in a in a place where he's studied under the best 
you know, mm -hmm. in, in my, in my imagination, when I'm creating mm -hmm. his backstory, studied with the best. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, think of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is one of my personal heroes mm -hmm. and a, a lot of his contemporaries, you know, the, the Stoics, Epictetus mm -hmm. and um, Aristotle and Seneca. So these guys way ahead of their time and Marcus Aurelius in particular, you know, a great emperor, a great leader, but mm. a virtuous, lived a virtuous, morally, morally, um, morally correct or mm. morally righteous life. And he mm -hmm. aspired um, toward virtue, virtue as mm. the greatest um, uh, target, the greatest goal mm. of life, the, 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 the meaning of life. Mm. And so anyway, I, I, I'm, forgive me for being long winded, but but. Atticus has had his teachers. He's put a, put all of this into practice, and now he finds certain um, certain characters, certain people that are uh, his students. And Pilate, I'm not going to call Pilate a, a student, but Atticus takes on the role of mentor with Pilate, mm -hmm. uh, advisor, counselor, mm -hmm. and so and so. I mean. He, it, it, it's it's just a, an amazing opportunity again to play a different to wear a different hat in a different relationship. Mm. You know, he has a different mm. relationship uh, with Jesus. I mean, and we're seeing a relationship mm -hmm. built. You know, it's mostly mm. uh, from what I hear and what I witness, because mm -hmm. um, I haven't had a lot of Atticus hasn't a lot had a lot of face to face time with Jesus, mm. but. Um, I've certainly met met with a lot of the and you know uh, communed with a lot of the Jewish religious authority. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a few of the disciples. There have been small interactions. Mm -hmm. I've gathered a lot of information. So there's there is um, material that's starting to build a relationship, mm -hmm. right? With Pilate, here's an inexperienced young governor mm. who is plays as we all know plays a very instrumental role in the life of jesus in the mm. you know um a governmental role mm -hmm. um and he he comes to atticus for uh, for support for help for mm. for uh, for advice mm. so we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more mm. of that. And, and it's um, in terms of Atticus as mentor, advisor, counselor, uh, mm. a father figure. I mean, mm. that's just there naturally with the age difference. Mm. Um, uh, Atticus is someone Pilate admires and respects mm. and uh, listens to. So I've got, mm. I've got, I've got his attention. I've got mm. his ear. And I've got his open heart, so mm. so it's uh, you know there's that's why it's so like and I love working with with the the actor he's such a terrific terrific uh, young man, mm. um, and we have a, a natural rapport which just helps mm. with you know telling telling that story, yeah mm. yeah so it's 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 gonna be it's gonna get even more. Um, personal and uh intimate in terms of mm. and deeper in terms of that relationship yeah as, as jesus you know runs afoul of of rome or you know and pilots put into the position of having to judge uh jesus that may be a, a complicated uh or challenging moment for for atticus as well uh, because of that relationship yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. uh and you know we see, look, Atticus is a, Atticus is a human being, and he's been um, moved, let's mm -hmm. just say, by what he's seeing, what is happening, what he's mm -hmm. witnessed, and so um, it, it just sets the stage for, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when the when the stakes become more intense, um, and Everyone is in crisis mode when it get when when a, when decisions have to be made. We have enough. Uh, um, we have enough. We have an, uh, enough 
knowledge of these characters hmm. to understand that it costs mm. everybody. You know, mm. it costs those people who are involved. Hmm. Look, Pilot, Pilot is someone who's also very interested and very um, curious about what's happening. Mm. He takes a particular interest in hmm. the Jewish culture, you know, hmm. in, in the culture that, I mean, he's, the Romans are occupying, right? They're occupying this land. They're, they're, they're um, uh, colonialists, right? They're colonizing. Um, that's what they did. So yeah. they're, so, but, but both Pilot and, but both Pilot and Atticus have taken particular interest. I mean, it's like that, you know, the, the old adage, you know, in order to, and, and I'm not even con considering them an enemy, mm -hmm. them the enemy, because they're not, but they are under our rule, right? Under mm -hmm. Roman rule. And so they're, and if you want to look at it technically, they are the, uh, they are the, they're colonized. Yeah. So, but in order to rule, in order to rule appropriately and justly in, in the, from the perspective of the Roman Empire, you have to, you have to um, get to a deep understanding of how these mm. people think, how they work, what's mm. important to them, right? Mm. And so, so both Pilate and Atticus have, have an intimate, deep, um, or are developing a deep understanding of, of the culture, of the people, it, in order to to create, I mean, I think I think ultimately Pilate wants the same thing. Mm. You know, Pilate wants peace as well. He doesn't mm. want. I mean, he's he's governing. He's a governor. He wants to yeah. keep his position, right? Mm. And if he's got if he's got a if he's overseeing a civil war, the emperor is going to replace him because mm. that's not what the emperor wants. Mm. The emperor wants peaceful colonies, mm. right? As as they move through the world. You know, the sun hmm. at this time, the sun never set on the Roman Empire. Yeah, I, I really have enjoyed kind of just getting your insight into kind of the mindset and uh, the backstory of of where, um, yeah, where Atticus is coming from. Uh, looking forward, I'm just curious, is there anything that you're really excited for either in season four or just beyond? I mean, you've already kind of mentioned a little bit, but anything else that you're looking forward to with your character? I'm looking forward to it all. As as you know, as an actor, you know, we get we get the the scripts a season at a time. You know, mm -hmm. the, the the creators of this show have have a long, you know, wide, long term vision and they've had a trajectory mm -hmm. of how this will unfold and be told through seven seasons. But yep. as actors, we don't we don't we're not we're not privy to that information from the mm -hmm. get go. So we we get our storyline season by season. And mm. um, I can tell you that, so, so I know very little, actually. <laughs> actually, mm. um, we don't, uh, we're not a part of those conversations. So I can, I can speculate myself um, mm. and I have done, done my part in terms of what I'm given collaborating mm. with the writers, collaborating with Dallas as director and writer uh, and mm. creator. I, I do my part in bringing mm. my own, you know, uh, interpret, interpretive skill to the character. But mm. ultimately, I don't know the future. I don't know mm. necessarily where I'm going. Um, mm. But I do know, I do know a little bit about where The Chosen is going. I mean, mm. we all know how it ends or or how yeah. it how it begins um right because um, mm -hmm. there are several beginnings uh in in uh you know the story of christ and um mm -hmm. and the story that we're, we're all telling um, mm -hmm. but i will tell you that each season like season four takes it is really next level it really mm -hmm. in terms of not only in terms of the production to production values, um, the the stakes as mm. as in the greatest story ever told, right? The stakes get higher mm. as we get closer to the inevitable. Mm. But one of the many things this 
series does so well is it it really does chronologically create higher and greater stakes become mm -hmm. more intensified uh, become and that's part of what Jesus was dealing with right I mean he was dealing mm -hmm. with this culmination of attrition and challenge and difficulty mm -hmm. um, as he was launched into the inevitable and so the season four really takes it it's mind-blowing I mean we just mm -hmm. we were just at the premiere last week uh, and so we were in LA and we, we saw the first two episodes mm. and it's astounding. Mm. It's astounding. Um, it just really takes it to a whole new, you just feel the tension mm. building towards something. Mm. And the story, the storytelling is so, so detailed and so specific moment to moment. I mean, re really uh, brilliantly done by the creators mm. and the con conceivers because because they had that long seven season vision they mm. were able to plant seeds in each scene in each mm. character's journey um i mean i'm i'm still bewildered and amazed at how they did it mm. but it's it's so specific and so subtle and so well crafted that you mm. really feel like you're present with mm. uh, and fe viscerally feeling um, that mo forward momentum that mm. toward, I, I, I just love that word inevitable, the inevitability mm. of things. Um, and yet, and yet it's so surprising because you, you, you think, mm. I mean, honestly, people, you're wondering, even me as someone involved, in in the middle of it i'm thinking to myself maybe it turns out differently you know maybe maybe christ isn't crucified hmm. maybe it's going to turn out differently and then you hmm. then you're brought back to the story you know i think part of that is because you've become so invested in jesus as the man right so hmm. invested in in him as a human being it's so hmm. relatable it's so that you that you feel like Oh, maybe he's going to, you know, and, and he's surrounded by human beings, you know, mm. even those that are the sort of the, the most limited and narrow in their vision. You know, I bring up, you, you think of Quintus, right? He's, he's very um, narrow, myopic in his thinking, uh, very self-serving. He's con concerned mm. mostly about keeping his job, right? Mm. Um, about his own survival. But even Quintus is a wonderfully fleshed out human being. And so you, you think you think to yourself, oh, look at these. Look at this. You know, you've got all these people being. In curious and intrigued, mm. intrigued and, and moved by this mm. peaceful creature, by this prophet, even Sh um, Shmuel, um, Shmuel, mm -hmm. Shmuel, you know, the rabbi, uh, he's. He's starting to think about, oh, you know, the 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 power of this peaceful preacher, right? The and the humanity and the and the sense, the 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 sense that he makes. I mean, the 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 he's a he's a charismatic leader. He's so you so you think I bring that up because you're thinking about like his audience member. Oh my goodness! And we know how the story unfolds, right? But you're thinking. Oh, maybe it could turn out differently. Look at this. Hmm. Look at how all of these human beings surrounding this, you know, look at how they're being moved and touched hmm. and how they're questioning, you know, so, oh, hmm. so maybe it will. And I think that's the power of the storytelling and the, hmm. the movie making, you know, the, the hmm. filming, the, the, is that it's, it's creating possibility. You know, mm. as you're watching it unfold, you, we all know the stories. We know these stories. They're taken mm. directly from Scripture. I mean, mm. the in-between moments are filled out, you know, are filled out. And a, a lot comes from the imagination. It has to mm -hmm. because we don't know, you know, the moment-to-moment the -moment goings-on mm -hmm. uh, of, of those relationships, how they unfolded, you know, the conversations mm. they had. 
Mm. We know about what was documented by the Gospels, mm. right? But what this does so well, and I think why so many people are moved by it, is that it really is unfolding moment to moment. It mm. keeps us present. It keeps us involved. It keeps us always uh, dwelling in possibility. What if? Mm. What if it could be different, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, because of that, there's a moment of hope. There's a moment mm. of such hope, right? Mm. And, and then given that, to know where it to know where it ends or again mm. where it begins again begins anew mm. is just it's it makes it an exciting exhilarating mm. surprising ride mm. for everybody and mm. uh, and also for i got to say for us us who are involved i'll speak for myself but for me involved it's exciting to know where it's mm. going moment to moment and mm. it's good it's good that i don't know in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, because, because, you know, I can see, scene by scene, what, what, um, where I fit in as Atticus, mm -hmm. where I fit into the telling of this story, and the function and the role I play. Um, but within that, uh, there's a lot of room for my own surprise and mm -hmm. uh, uh, excitement. And I think that's mm. what makes it, I, anyway, I could go on and on and on about this, but I think that's what makes it such an exciting first ever once in a lifetime experience and event. This, this, mm. this, uh, this, uh, more than production, this phenomenon of the chosen. Mm. Um, but I think at the heart of it, it's, it's great, compelling, storytelling and it and mm. I, I think one of the reasons it is so it is that is because it dwells in possibilities it keeps yeah. it creates space for anything to happen mm. given a story we all know we know the beginning middle and end mm. and yet yet people are tuning in across the world and it's because of it's because of that to to hear a mm. story to watch a story unfold that they all know They've been told. They've been. St they've studied in Bible school. They've heard in, you know, on Sunday mornings. They've studied in Bible in 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 groups, you know, and yet they're tuning in. I mean, close to 800 million worldwide viewers. I mean, why would they tune in to hear a story that they know already? Mm -hmm. um, I think. What I described is part of the reason why, and it makes it very exciting for all of us. I mean, we really are. It's a chosen family. It really mm -hmm. are. The, the, the spectators, the viewers, you, Kevin, you mm -hmm. know, who are, you know, just engaged in, in, in not only your viewership, but also what you doing, what you do is, you know, you're, you're a part of the extended family here. And it's, it's part of a, part of a movement that has at the core of it, um, a, a deep, a, a deep hope, a deep mm. hope and possibility for not only this, you know, this telling of the of the seven seasons of the chosen, but for the future, for the future. Mm. So, so I think that's part of the attraction and appeal of this, and uh, I'm really excited to see see where it goes. We're we're expecting, I guess, within the next month to get the scripts for season five. And so that's always an exciting time for that cast. Mm. Um, so we'll we'll see where it's going, you know, next season. Mm. And uh, uh, yeah, it's really exciting um, mm. uh, to dwell to dwell in possibility. So mm. wow, that's an amazing. Forgive note me for to, going on. To... I'm sure you you. Oh. Uh, I'm... <laughs> no, I that that was like just really uh, psyched me up for for season four. Uh, it sounds like. It's going to be just amazing. So, uh, thank you so much for kind of that note of of hope for not just the show, but for you know uh, what it is bringing to people. Um, yeah, um, I know you got to go soon. But I was just going to ask, um, yeah, any kind of last thoughts either on the show or other things that you're working on that you want to share about? Um, yeah, I just want to provide uh, some more space for you. Well, I'll just echo you know what I was trying to get at in, in uh, what I just sort of dove into 
is that the, what the world needs most now is hope, I think, mm. because, and the, and the root of that word is, is about the belief that the future will be better than the present, right? Mm. What we all strive to do is while we're here in these bodies, in, during this lifetime on earth, is to leave not only to, to become stewards of this earth, our planet, to become um, uh, better communicators, to deepen our relationships with one another, to uh, honor God, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is obviously, uh, I'll speak for myself, but, but I think the collective intention is to leave the earth in a better condition than where we found mm -hmm. it and to leave the people in our lives our loved ones, our community members, the people we touch through our work, to leave them better off, right? Mm -hmm. When we go, to leave um, and to bring love and hope. Mm -hmm. And I and so I think, you know, art reflects that. I think that's why you do what you do, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but I, I get a feeling that's what why you do what you do. It's certainly what I why I do what I do. Um, to create the possibility for leaving this earth and leaving the people that we are fortunate enough, to, people whose lives we're fortunate enough to touch, leaving them better off when we leave. Mm -hmm. And I think art, I mean, when you're dealing with TV and film, you're dealing with the immortality in a way mm -hmm. of art, right? Um, mm -hmm. So... I, I, I'm involved in many pro projects right now. One of them, um, I'm actually writing one right now, which is all based based on all of the things we talked about. Um, it's about about Marc Chagall, actually the um, uh, painter who was um, rescued during World War II or just before during the German occupation of France, rescued by. Um, Varian Fry, who led an organization, he's now one of the Righteous Among Nations, but he, an American, um, went to France and decided he was, because of his love of art and artists and artistry, he decided it was his life's work to, serve, to rescue as many artists from Europe before they were sent to concentration camps by Hitler and, uh, and the Nazi regime, right? Who were in power at the time. So here's a man who rescued, risked his own life to uh, rescue artists. Um, so he ended up, he and his organization ended up rescuing over 2,000 artists before they and their families were sent to concentration camps. Uh, many of them were Jews, but they weren't all uh, Jews. Um, among those people he rescued were Marc Chagall, uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, the philosopher and writer, and uh, Marcel Duchamp. Anyway, I've, I've, I've become fascinated these days with people who do things like that with their lives, risk their very life to save another soul. And so I've become, uh, that's going to be the focus of my next project. It's going to be a one-man show. So I'm writing that now. I'm also involved in uh, the Mitzvah Project, which is a one-man show educational program that I'm touring throughout the country and hopefully other other countries to come. But it it is it's about uh, it takes place in the darkest days of the Holocaust. It's about uh, two lives colliding, intersecting in Auschwitz in the concentration camp and. So it's a program of social justice. It speaks about, it asks big questions um, about why, why do we demonize the other? Why do we discriminate against someone because of the color of their skin, their religion, uh, what they believe in, who they choose to love, how they identify? The Mitzvah Project has become, so, uh, so uh, during the pandemic, when the pandemic happened, I became a teacher. I taught high school and through that work, got much more involved in working with young people. Then I got the opportunity to be a guest artist 
uh, with the mitzvah project. And so as of January 2023, I've been touring it all over the country, and it's become sort of a, a main uh, part of my focus and inspired me to write my own show because I've seen, I love the, 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 uh, um, the connection that you have with a live public of young people. Um, the, the program consists of three different parts. There's a, there's a performative part for, uh, that's about 20 minutes. Then there's a lecture portion and then there's a Q and A and it's, it's literally changed my life. In particular, the, the, these question and answer sessions with the, this younger generation of, of people um, who are dealing with challenges and obstacles and difficulties that I didn't have to at their age. Um, it's a whole new ballgame, you know, since the pandemic. And so to be able to create these spaces where we can have these really difficult really important conversations with the, the generation of young people who are the ones who are going to change the world, the ones who are responsible for changing the world, a world which is very broken, a world which is in, in disrepair and, 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 and hugely disconnected, um, not, only, you know, the, the, not only in terms of the people, there's huge disconnect between people, but also disconnect with nature and with mother nature and with our earth. Anyway, I could go on and on, but so this has become my life's work. And so this is what I'm doing. And actually you can go to my website. Um, I, I can send you my website. It's well, it's www.elijahalexander.net. And it's, it has all the information of the, you know, the mitzvah projects that I'm doing, uh, all the, you know, upcoming stuff for the chosen that I'm involved in. Um, yeah, I'm going, I'm actually going in a couple days. I'll be in San Francisco. I'll, I'll be at a high school there in the Bay area. And then I'll be back in Denver, Colorado. And ho hopefully this spring I'll be on the East coast in New York and uh, the Midwest in Chicago as well. So, yeah, so that's, that's basically what I'm, what is occupying my time now in between the mitzvah project and, then we we um, were sl uh, slated to go into production for season five of the chosen end of April. So, yeah, until then, I'm staying open to opportunities and um, but f furthering the work that I'm most passionate about. Well, thank you so much, Elijah, for uh, joining us. I've yeah, I've really just been encouraged, and I feel like just some of your insights have have opened my mind about the the character and and also some of the just the implications of the show. So uh, I really appreciate uh, your work on the show, but also all the stuff that you're, you're doing outside of it as well. So grateful for, uh, for your presence and, and all of your work. Um, yeah. Thanks again uh, for joining us.